A citizen in the 19th century called it the most disgraceful, atrocious, unjust, detestable, heathenish, barbarous, diabolical, man-degrading, woman-murdering, demon-pleasing, heaven-defying act ever perpetrated. In this case, the citizen was referring to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, the topic of our guest's new book, The War Before the War, Fugitive Slaves and the Struggle for America's Soul from the Revolution to the Civil War, described by the New York Times as a riveting and unsettling account that sheds new light on the subject. Andrew Delbanco is the Alexander Hamilton Professor of American Studies at Columbia University. Time Magazine called him America's best social critic, and there is ample evidence to support the claim. His essays on history and culture are frequently featured in the New York Review of Books, and he is the author of many notable works, including College, Melville, the book for which he was last here, The Real American Dream, and Required Reading, Why Our American Classics Matter. Dalbanco is the winner of the Great Teacher Award from the Society of Columbia Graduates and a recipient of the National Humanities Medal. It's an honor to have him back. Please welcome Andrew Dalbanco to the Free Library. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and Andy reminded me that it's been 13 years since I was here last, which uh, I want to think is a lucky number. Um, let me start by saying something it probably doesn't need to be said, but maybe ought to be said anyway, and that is that my subject, slavery, that's a word that's going to be mentioned several times in the coming half hour or so, is a subject that it's impossible for anyone to speak or, or write about convincingly. I say that in the same sense that I think, you know, no one who hasn't experienced combat can write about what it must be like to be under fire. No one who has not faced a deadly life-threatening illness can write about the experience of being ill. So none of us really has the authority to talk about this subject, and yet here I am standing presumptuously in front of you preparing to talk about it nevertheless, and I hope that that paradox will make some sense and that the attempt will feel justified by the time we're through. When I say this, I think of one of the fugitive slaves of the 1850s who had fled from Kentucky and found a sort of quasi-freedom in the North who spoke to a group of anti-slavery activists in New England and said, if I were to speak to you of slavery, I would whisper. Slavery cannot be represented Slavery can never be represented. And I think we should just kind of get that out there for starters. Now having said that, and being here in Philadelphia, I thought it might be appropriate to begin with some words from a local hero, Ben Franklin, uh, who wrote this in the 1770s. And this was a time, and that time lasted for quite a while in our history when a lot of White people were talking a lot of nonsense about how slavery was really benign and beneficial not only for slave owners, but for slaves. And Ben Franklin, who kind of had a way of cutting through the nonsense, put it this way in 1770. A slave, he wrote, is a human creature stolen, taken by force, or bought of another or of himself with money and who being so taken or bought is compelled to serve the taker or purchaser during pleasure or during life. He may be sold again or let for hire by his master to another and is then obliged to serve that other. He's one who is bound to obey not only the commands of his master, but also the commands of the lowest servant of that master when set over him who must come when he is called, go when he is bid, and stay when he is ordered, though to the farthest part of the world and in the most unwholesome climate, who must wear such clothes as his master thinks fit to give him and no other, and must be content with such food or subsistence as his master thinks fit to order for him or with such small allowance in money as shall be given him in lieu of victuals or clothing, who must never absent himself from his master's service without leave, 
who is subject to severe punishments for small offenses, to enormous whippings and even death, for absconding from his service or for disobedience to orders. Now that's a pretty effective generalization, I think, about the condition of servitude. And it's important to recognize, as Franklin knew, that slavery is one of those words that covers a lot of different kinds of conditions. I mean, it was one thing to be a slave on a plantation in the Deep South. It was another thing to be a slave in, say, Baltimore, where you might be hired out and allowed even to keep a certain portion of your wages. And yet, Franklin cuts to the heart of the matter that there are some truths that cut across the differences. It also ought to be said right up front that Franklin, like the rest of the founding fathers, perhaps less than some, was not exactly unimplicated in the institution of slavery himself. As an early newspaper editor, he accepted advertisements for slaves for sale and owned a couple of slaves in his own lifetime, though he also became a charter member of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. So, Unlike all the rest of us, he was a complicated person with some contradictions, and I'm going to be talking about contradictions as we proceed. Now, another generalization that I would add to Franklin's list that I think I would stand behind and is not terribly controversial is that human beings do not wish to be enslaved. And so one of the phenomena that slave traders and slave owners had to deal with from the very beginning was that slaves tried to run away. This was true on the west coast of Africa when the first European slave traders came and with the cooperation of other Africans in some cases, seized human beings and packed them aboard ship to take them to the new world. Uh, they equipped these captives with neck halters that had spikes protruding so that if they tried to escape inland through the underbrush, the spikes would catch in the bramble and they wouldn't be able to make any progress. As early as 1683, South Carolina adapted an act to prevent runaways. 100 years later, Georgia established a nightly slave patrol in its main port city that came to be known as the Savannah Watch. And in the last years of British colonial rule, British officials favored draining wetlands in order to prevent, and this is their language, deserting slaves and wild beasts from finding shelter in the swamps. Now something that I've come to learn in the course of writing the book and talking to people about it that we don't all always recognize is that one milestone in this history of efforts to constrain slaves from running is the United States Constitution itself. When the delegates from 13 colonies, or more accurately 12, because the Rhode Islanders didn't show up here in Philadelphia to work on that document. So when representatives from 12 colonies came together to try to put together a compact in the wake of the revolution, they, they understood that they were fundamentally representing two separate countries. In the southern colonies, slavery was the bedrock of economy and culture. In the northern colonies, slavery was already, by 1787, on the road to extinction. It took a while. New York was one of the laggard states, didn't abolish slavery completely until the late 1820s. And this fact, I think, is not to be construed to mean that everybody in the North was moral and farsighted and scrupulous and everybody in the South was evil and satanic, but that for external reasons having to do with climate and the nature of the economy, slavery became more and more integral to the life of the Southern colonies and more and more peripheral and marginal to the life of the Northern colonies. So under these circumstances, to contemplate putting these two countries together into one country, one, there were a lot of problems that were evident quickly, but one problem that was immediately uh, in the forefront was 
what to do if an enslaved person decided to take him or herself bodily from a state where slavery was legal to a state where slavery was illegal. And it quickly became clear that there was going to be no constitution unless they built into it what I am inclined to call a sort of intranational extradition treaty. That is, they had to make a deal that the northern states would recognize the, this human property, odious as they might find the conception of slavery, otherwise there would be no constitution. And that's what happened. They wrote into the Constitution what we now know of as the Fugitive Slave Clause, which I'll quote to you in full in a couple of minutes, uh, requiring the rendition of fugitives to those who claimed their service or labor. One of the uh, South Carolinian delegates, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, and remember they had to go back to their home states after the convention here in Philadelphia and persuade the citizenry to ratify this Constitution went back to Charleston and sort of bragged that they had achieved this. He said, we have obtained a right to recover our slaves in whatever part of America they may take refuge, which is a right we had not before. Therefore, vote for this constitution. And as a literary type, I try to pay close attention to the words. I was struck when I first read that by that word refuge whatever part of America they may take, refuge. This is a guy who at the same time is talking about how great it is for the slaves to be enslaved. They're well taken care of, they don't have to worry about providing for themselves and so on. So then you want to ask yourself, well then what is it, why would they want to seek refuge? So this is another example of, of a person contradicting himself and sort of unconsciously knows something about the truth that consciously he doesn't want to admit to himself. I should mention perhaps also, you may have registered that name Pinckney. You may remember that horrific day three plus years ago in 2015 when the Reverend Clementa Pinckney, along with many members of his congregation, was murdered in his church in Charleston. Um, quite possibly a descendant of this Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. One of the ways in which I found, as I wrote this book, that I think I was describing something like the tragic arc of American history with which we are by no means yet finished. In any case, they, they put in this fugitive slave clause and I wanna just read it to you quickly. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein, that is in the sanctuary state, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. There it is, Fugitive Slave Clause of the US Constitution. Now, some of you in the room are teachers like me, and, and when you get papers from your students, I suspect you say, Avoid the passive voice, right? Use active verbs. Uh, but you'll note that this is formulated in the passive, right? Be discharged, be delivered up. In other words, it's a weak document. It doesn't say who's to do the delivering up. The local police, the state authorities, the federal government. It just kind of leaves that question wide open to be determined who knows when. It quickly became an issue. That is, how was this to be enforced? Immediately, almost immediately became an issue. By the 1790s, one of Mr. Pinckney's colleagues from South Carolina, a man named Pierce Butler, was here in Philadelphia uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the Congress, which met in Philadelphia for a while. And Pennsylvania, as many of you know, and Pennsylvania should be proud of this, as early as 1780 had passed a law stating that any slave brought into Pennsylvania who was in residence here for more than six months was automatically legally emancipated. 
So members of the abolition society showed up at Mr. Butler's door and they had been tracking him and watching him and they knew that he was living with a slave. A slave, his name was actually Ben. And they said to him, they knocked on the door one day and they said, listen, um, your slave has been here for more than six months. Uh, by the laws of Pennsylvania, he's a free man. And Pierce Butler replied, I am a citizen of South Carolina. What have the laws of Pennsylvania got to do with me? And there, I think, is one of many instances I could throw many more at you, but in the interest of time, I won't. Uh, you could see how weak this federation, this, this union that they had tried to cobble together really was, and how undetermined was this question of what did the laws of one state owe to the laws of another. James Madison, one of the architects of the Constitution, put it this way. He said, the laws of the several states were uncharitable to one another. And what he meant by that primarily was that in some states slavery was legal, in other states it was illegal. So this question uh, of the status of a fugitive continued to be vexed and unresolved. Now to leap over 50 or 60 years of American history in about two minutes, you all know, we all know, that the nation expanded rapidly westward in the, over the course of the first half of the 19th century. So this border between the slave states and the free states became longer and longer and more and more porous. It was no longer just a problem of, say, a, a, an enslaved person in Maryland or Virginia taking himself to, uh, to uh, Pennsylvania. Now it was also an issue of someone in Kentucky taking himself to Ohio. And as time went by, Northerners became, blacks and whites, uh, became angrier and angrier at the, at, the, at the South, accusing them of coming North and kidnapping people under the pretext that they had been previously enslaved. And Southerners became angrier and angrier on the grounds that Northerners were enticing their slaves to run away, especially as the organized abolitionist movement of the 1830s and 40s picked up steam. Finally, in the wake of the Mexican War, which expanded the territorial size of the United States immensely by something like 30% of the size of our present day nation, these sectional tensions reached a boiling point. And Congress faced the challenge of trying to make one more deal. That deal was the notorious Compromise of 1850, and at the center of that compromise was the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 that Andy already uh, signaled to you would be at the center of my remarks. Passed by Congress in August of 1850, signed by the President Millard Fillmore, a New Yorker, who said he didn't much like slavery, but signed it anyway in September. It wasn't so much an amendment to the Constitution as it was an amplification of the Constitution. Indeed, when the Virginia senator who sponsored it introduced it, he described it as a measure, quote, to provide for the more effectual execution of the third clause of the second section, fourth article of the Constitution of the United States. Now, this law has one of the worst and richly deserved as such reputations of any piece of legislation in our history, which is saying something, right? I mean, there's some pretty stiff competition for bad laws passed by the Congress. And I know I could hear from backstage that Andy read this to you, but I like the list of adjectives so much I'm going to read it again. One person called it the most disgraceful, atrocious, unjust, detestable, heathenish, barbarous, diabolical, man-degrading, woman-murdering, demon-pleasing, heaven-defying act ever perpetrated. Good list. It was a merciless law. It denied the most basic right enshrined in the Anglo-American legal tradition to the accused fugitive, that is the right of habeas corpus, the right to challenge in open court the legality of their detention. It forbade the accused to testify in his or her own defense. It ruled out trial by jury. It wasn't interested in any of the circumstances that may have led 
this person to flee. The person might have been repeatedly beaten or raped, immaterial, as they say in the courts. It made the act of aiding or abetting a fugitive a federal crime. Anybody who came to the, to the assistance of such a person was committing a federal crime. And it created or enlarged a whole class of new federal officers called commissioners who had the right quite outside any duly constituted court to make the judgment of whether this person had indeed belonged to the claimant who had sent bounty hunters after him or her and to send him back. In short, it confirmed that black people were less than citizens indeed were treated as less than human. It infused the lives of black people, some who had been previously enslaved, others who had never been enslaved, with terror. Every footstep on the stairs, every knock on the door might mean that the slave catchers were coming after them. A lot of people said a lot of things about the law, perhaps the most succinct comment pertinent to this point I can offer you is come, comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson, arguably the leading intellectual of the North, who said, no one that was not ready to go on all fours would back this law. Now, you can probably tell we're making a, have a little turn in the, in the discussion. I sometimes say to my students, uh, I'm in the confusion business. I don't think there's any confusion about the moral indefensibility of that law. But it gets confusing when you note that if you look for people crawling in the muck, as Emerson would have it, among those you find down there is none other than Abraham Lincoln. Now Lincoln, and we could spend another couple of hours talking about this, we won't. Lincoln hated slavery, and he used that word. I cannot but hate it. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world. He went on to say it exposes us as hypocrites because we talk to the world about how we believe in freedom and yet we live in a country based on slavery. And I hate it, he said, because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. And yet we find this same man in 1855 in a letter to a friend writing, I hate to see the poor creatures hunted down and returned to their stripes and their unrequited toil, but I bite my lip and keep quiet. That takes some processing. In that same letter to that same friend, he writes of how much the great body of the northern people do crucify their feelings in order to maintain their loyalty to the Constitution and the Union. So the qu question I want to raise is, what was this loyalty about? What drove Lincoln, and he was hardly alone in this circumstance, though my book has a number of figures in it, lawyers, judges, who felt deeply the injustice of slavery and yet felt obliged to enforce the law as first articulated in the Constitution and as re-articulated in the law of 1850. The short answer to that question, I think, is because Lincoln and many others in the early 1850s believed that the, that the continuance of the Union depended on it. Just as there would have been no Constitution without a Fugitive Slave Clause, in 1850 it seemed very likely, because Southerners said so and seemed to mean what they said, that they would be out of the Union without an enforceable Fugitive Slave Law in 1850. In other words, that secession would have come in 1850 instead of 11 years later when it did come. Now, about Lincoln's relation to the Union, 
Alexander Stevens, who was a colleague of his in the Congress in the late 1840s and then went on, a man from Georgia, went on to be the vice president of the Confederacy, said of Lincoln, his devotion to the Union rose to the sublimity of religious mysticism. Which Stevens meant very critically, and it's one of the interesting things about Lincoln. This is Stevens on Lincoln's right, far to his right, because Stevens was a guy who believed that the Founding Fathers had gotten it all wrong and that slavery was the essence of what it meant to be an American and that the Confederacy would be based on slavery even more than the original Union was. So he thought that Lincoln was a nut job for his devotion to the Union. And people on Lincoln's left who were appalled by his quote unquote conservatism and moderation and who thought that he should have stood up and denounced that law, thought his devotion to the Union was equally preposterous. Something that pe people often don't realize is that there was strong secessionist sentiment in the North in the 1850s as well as in the South, including among abolitionists who took the view, we don't want to have anything to do with these slave owners down South. So let's just let them go their way and we'll go our way. Lincoln and some of the others in the middle of this story thought that would have been a very bad idea. They thought it would have been a very bad idea because they thought it was quite likely that if the South had seceded in 1850, there was no will to resist in the North. And those of you who have studied the Civil War know that even when secession came 10 years later, it was a close call as to whether there would be the will to take up arms in the North to resist the secessionists. And it would certainly have been a close call even if there had been the will as to whether the North could have prevailed in a conflict with the South in 1850. So if the South had gone its own way in 1850, it seemed quite likely to people of Lincoln's point of view that they would st strike out into the world and establish a slave-based empire for, uh, for themselves, expanding into the Caribbean, Cuba, further into Mexico, and that slavery might actually be perpetuated for uh, another 100 years. In other words, Lincoln believed, and this would be the subject for another lecture, that the preservation of the Union was the best strategy to put, as he often put it, to put slavery in the path of ultimate extinction. And we can talk about why he believed that maybe during the Q&A, but that he believed it, I think, is clear. So as I hope is evident from what I've said so far, I'm, I'm confronting, when, when I did the reading for this book and the thinking about it and the writing of it, I'm confronting what I found to be a difficult paradox. And people of deep anti-slavery conviction found themselves defending a union that had built into it protections for slavery. Because the Constitution made it clear that the federal government did not have the authority to interfere with the legal institutions of the several states. So by supporting the Constitution, you were implicitly supporting slavery. And yet at the same time, by supporting the Constitution and the Union, people of Lincoln's view felt that that was the only road toward the ultimate emancipation. It's a complicated subject. Again, we can talk about it later if you like. The last time I was here at the Free Library, I was talking about Herman Melville. Herman Melville, just about at this moment, just before the passage of the law in 1850, put it this way. Humanity cries out against this vast enormity, slavery, but not one man knows a prudent remedy. By prudent, he meant some way of destroying slavery without destroying the nation itself. Now, not surprisingly, quite a few black people didn't have much patience for this argument. Frederick Douglass, after Lincoln's death, and he and Lincoln had a very complicated relationship, mutual respect, I think, in the end, wrote of Lincoln, he was willing to pursue, recapture, and send back the fugitive slave to his master and to suppress a slave rising for liberty if that's what it took to preserve the Union. 
And that's a true statement. So, for all these reasons, he and others like him were willing to countenance this odious fugitive slave law. And that brings me to sort of another turn in the, in the, in the narrative. I had a late colleague at Columbia who coined a phrase that I think you've all heard, the law of unintended consequences. Well, if ever there was a law with unintended consequences, it was the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. Frederick Douglass himself understood this very well and said the Fugitive Slave Law as odious as it was, and these are his words, did a great service to the anti-slavery movement. What kind of service did it do? It was meant to hold the nation together, but in fact it accelerated the estrangement between South and North. How? Because it made it impossible for people in the North to pretend to themselves any longer that slavery was not their problem that slavery was a southern problem and not a northern problem. You could maybe convince yourself of that even though you were walking around wearing cotton clothing that was provided to you by slave labor. You could ignore the fact that the bank in downtown Boston or New York was financing the plantations. You could turn the other way from the fact that the Industrial Revolution was underway because the textile mills in Massachusetts and Connecticut were weaving a slave-grown cotton into cloth for export and domestic consumption. But when you saw a human being being literally dragged in shackles to the local jailhouse and then sent to the ship on the pier and sent back into slavery in your own town, very possibly, this was happening in Boston, in Poughkeepsie, in Syracuse, all over the north someone you might well have known for 15 or 20 years because there was no statute of limitations in the fugitive slave law. Then it was a lot harder to pretend that slavery was a southern problem and not an American problem. The, consequ the unintended consequences of the fugitive slave law were legion. It created what you might think of as the first Black Lives Matter movement. Black activism suddenly became an important force in American social and political life. A biracial resistance movement arose. Powerful black intellectuals emerged in the newspapers and the periodicals and on the speaking circuit and in the churches throughout the North. Abolitionists invited, in some cases compelled, fugitive slaves like Frederick Douglass to speak to audiences far and wide to testify to their experiences. And they became enormously important to the accelerating anti-slavery movement. And it radicalized that anti-slavery movement. It even radicalized conservatives. One of those industrialists, Amos Lawrence, who was one of the big mill owners, said after he witnessed a fugitive slave returned to slavery from Boston in 1854, we went to bed as good compromise union conservatives and we woke up as stark mad abolitionists. Now one of the things, just say, I'll just say briefly that you know, it's a funny thing when you take a long time writing a book, you find that you're living in one world when you start it and you're living in another world when you're finishing it. So in the course of writing this book, I started to hear some really weird echoes with our own time and the story that I'm telling you tonight. You could describe a city like Boston where people organized to keep the federal authorities from seizing fugitives as a sanctuary city. And one of the things that you see happening in the 1850s is something that's happening right now. That is, the folks who used to cling to the doctrine of states' rights, right? We associate states' rights generally with the South and often with frankly racist policies like George Wallace in the front of the schoolhouse door in the 1950s and 60s saying segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, keep the federal government out of the business of Alabama. States' rights. Direct line from John C. Calhoun to George, George Wallace, states' rights. All of a sudden in 1850, slave owners loved the federal government. 
They loved the federal government because the federal government was proposing to enforce their quote-unquote property rights in human property. And Northerners, New Englanders, who had decried the doctrine of states' rights, all of a sudden became states' writers and said, the feds have no business in Boston telling us what to do with our neighbors. We're seeing something like that right now, right? With, this, with people on the progressive left turning to state attorneys general to defend our citizens and some of our non-citizens against the predatory practices of the federal government. History doesn't repeat itself, but there's this adage attributed to Mark Twain, though I don't know that he ever said it, but it does rhyme. <laughs> and I guess I found myself telling a rhyming story in this book. Uh, I wish it didn't rhyme as well as it, as it seems sometimes to do. Now there are, to me, and I'm gonna throw out some questions to which I have no answers. There are some, some difficult questions that arise from this story. One of which would be something like this. How do we judge people in the past for the choices they make? If we judge Lincoln and his fellow travelers in this regard by, say, the Christian standard of treating others as you would be treated yourself, there's no defense. He fails that test in his support of the fugitive slave law. But if we judge him on the basis of the consequences, even if there were unforeseen consequences that flowed from the fugitive slave law, that might be a different story. What were those consequences? Well, the country held together, more or less, for another 10 years. During the course of those 10 years, the population of the North got larger and larger. The economic and cultural alliance between North and West became stronger with the construction of the railroads, whereas before the West was dependent on those rivers, North-South river routes, so they were more closely allied to the South. And by the time the final break came, and I, I describe, I, I, I say in the book that the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was the spark that lit the fuse that led to the Civil War, that's not to say it was the only thing. Of course, there was the Kansas-Nebraska Act, there was the Dred Scott decision, there was John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. But in the course of the 1850s, the North consolidated the strength it needed to prevail in the conflict when it finally came. That conflict, which no one wanted, and then, as now, and as far as I can tell, almost always, everybody thought it would be a short war, right? It would last a few weeks, might be a few casualties, everybody would come to their senses, the war would be over. Remember Secretary Rumsfeld telling us at the start of the Iraq war that it would be a cakewalk, and now we've been in, in uh, Afghanistan, what, for 17 years, and there were three U.S. military killed just the day before yesterday, and God knows how many Af Afghanis. So the war came, and once the war came, all bets were off. All the constitutional constraints on what the federal government could do about slavery no longer applied. Lincoln suddenly was not the chief executive, he was the commander in chief. And his goal was to win that war. To win it no matter what it took to win it. And it's a remarkable story because you can see from the, almost from the very beginning how the war itself became the solution to the fugitive slave problem, if I can put it that way. So let me tell you a little short story that some of you may be familiar with. A guy named Benjamin Butler, Vermont lawyer who got a commission in the Union Army. By no, not even close to being an abolitionist. He was a Democrat, in fact, who had voted repeatedly for Jefferson Davis for President of the United States. But he's in the Union Army, and he's in charge of a fort in Virginia, Hampton Roads, Virginia. He's fortifying this fort, and the Confederate forces are fortifying, you know, a few hundred yards away. And on his second day there, three slaves show up. And they, they're admitted to the fort, and they say, listen, um, 
we don't want to be working for these people out there anymore. We want to work for you. And we gather that we might actually be compensated for working for you. So Butler doesn't quite know what to do, but he lets them in and ponders the situation. And a couple days later, a guy under a flag of truce shows up, comes to the fort and says, General Butler, nice to see you. You may remember me. We were at the Charleston Convention together. I'm representing Colonel Mallory. I believe you have three of his slaves here, and he wants them back. And Butler says, essentially, I, I don't think so. And this guy says, well, what, what do you mean you don't think? I mean, you, are you telling me you're not going to honor the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850? And Butler, who was up to date on the news, realized that the day, day before, Virginia had passed its ordinance of secession. So he says, well, as far as I know, Virginia claims to be a foreign country. The Fugitive Slave Law has nothing to do with a foreign country, so get out of my fort. Now, this was not a great moral uh, gesture, but Butler was smart enough to realize that slave labor was a tremendous asset to the enemy, and he would rather have these people helping him than fortifying uh, uh, the barricades of the enemy. And this story begins to be the story of the whole war. So a year or so later, General David Hunter, carrying out operations in coastal South Carolina, starts uh, not only uh, refusing to return fugitive slaves to their owners, but to uh, enlist them in the Union Army. And writes is one of my favorite phrases in this story. He writes to the Secretary of War in Washington, I have organized a fine regiment of persons whose late masters were fugitive rebels. <laughs> and he gets pushback from Washington uh, on that, but step by step, year by year, the significance of the, the, the slave, the asset that the slaves represented to the Union trumped, you'll forgive the, the term, <laughs> trumped all c contrary arguments. And as the Union Army advanced further and further into Confederate territory, hundreds of thousands of enslaved people became fugitives. And before the end of the war, almost 200,000 black soldiers had enlisted in the Union Army who be, were completely essential to the ultimate Union victory, many of them former slaves. Lincoln knows, sees that this is happening, and sometimes he tries to slow down the process in order to hold those border states, you know, Missouri, Kentucky, in the Union, and sometimes he allows the process to go faster, and it's one of the most dramatic uh, aspects of American history to watch Lincoln's deepening understanding of how the war itself has become the instrument by which the destiny of the Union, as he had always understand it, un understood it, would finally be realized. That is, to become a Union that was free of slavery. The dogmas of the quiet past, he says to Congress in 1862, are inadequate to the stormy present. We have to start thinking in a new way. And one of the new ways we have to think about is that this war, to use the famous phrase at Gettysburg, has brought to us a new birth of freedom. That the principle of the Declaration of Independence, universal human equality, would now become consistent with the Constitution and that the institution of slavery would not survive the war, which it barely did. Now. I would just, I'm almost wrapping it up here. I think Andy's getting restless in the back there. Uh, I would just say, <laughs> everything I've said to you tonight is obviously from the perspective of someone we all know what, we know what happened, right? We know that there was this compromise. We know there was this 10-year truce. We know that the war came, and we know that the war went on long enough so that slavery became a casualty of the war. I kind of knew this intellectually, but I didn't know it really viscerally until I tried to write this book. The hardest thing in thinking about the past is to remember that nobody knew what was going to happen. And we ought to keep that in mind. We don't have no idea what's going to happen, right? We don't know what's going to happen next week, next month, next year. 
when we judge these people for the choices they made, I think we should keep that in mind. And for those of us, and I'm sometimes in that frame of mind, who feel that in 1850 they should have let secession come and they should have had the war then and there, we might want to ask ourselves how many of us would welcome a conflict of this scale now to pursue any moral purpose. A million people died in the American Civil War in a nation of 30 million. You can extrapolate the numbers. 30, 40 million today, plus untold millions more physical and psychological casualties. Compare that to the disaster that happened to us on 9-11 when 3,000 people were killed. How many of us would, if we could have seen the future, said, yes, let's have this war? I'm not so sure. I want to close by returning to Frederick Douglass, who in the end of the day is the most subtle and most insightful student of Lincoln, I think, in our history. I remind you of what he said earlier, right? That he was willing to pursue the fugitive and suppress the liberty of the slave for the sake of the Union. This is what he said about Lincoln 15 years after, well, 12 years after the end of the war and 10, 12 years after Lincoln's assassination. His great mission, Douglas said, was to accomplish two things. First, to save his country from dismemberment and ruin. And second, to free his country from the great crime of slavery. To do one or the other or both, he must have the earnest sympathy and the powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Without this primary and essential condition to success, his efforts must have been vain and utterly fruitless. And this is just the key part of the passage. Had he put the abolition of slavery before the salvation of the Union, he would have inevitably driven from him a powerful class of the American people and rendered resistance to rebellion impossible. Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. There is that binocular vision, seeing it from both sides, that I think we get from the greatest writers, of whom Frederick Douglass was certainly one. Finally, let me close with Lincoln's own words. Back in 1854, he had written, when he thought, when he feared that slavery would be allowed to expand. Let us wash our Republican robe in the spirit, if not the blood, of the revolution. Turned out, it needed to be washed in the blood. And in the great second inaugural address, the words that we all know, he wrote or said, Every drop of blood drawn by the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword. Then so it must be said, quoting Psalms, chapter 19, verse 9, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now I'm sometimes asked, what's the moral of this story for our own time? The best I can do with that is to say that if we are honest about our past, and that means being honest not only about slavery and how deeply implicated the United States was from day one in the crime of slavery, but also the long afterlife of slavery in the form of racial injustice with which we are nowhere near done. If we're honest about our past, then maybe we have a better chance at working together toward a better future. Thanks very much. You're in the city of uh, brotherly and sisterly love. Could you tell us a little bit about how much of a sanctuary city Philadelphia was in the 1850s? Oh, Philadelphia was what? Yeah, Pennsylvania was an absolute, was a nerve center of what we now call the Underground Railroad. I mean, the Underground Railroad is really a metaphor. There were no train lines and stations. 
but um, there were lots of people, black and white, in Pennsylvania who gave sanctuary to fugitive slaves before and after the fugitive slave law. And Philadelphia was a, was a center. Now, when fugitives got to Philadelphia, it was often in their best interest to move further north because particularly after the law of 1850, they were vulnerable to recapture, so they would move typically to New York and then to New England and often on to Canada, which was really the only place they could find um, secure refuge. But Pennsylvania has, has reason to be proud. That doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of stories of Pennsylvania communities that are divided and where people are at each other's throats over these issues. And there were court cases in Pennsylvania and uh, breakouts of fugitives from, from prison in Pennsylvania, some of which I tell in, in my book. But by and large, it's, it's good to be a Pennsylvanian. Uh, so this is actually the material that I study, but I wonder if, um, if you wouldn't mind speaking to, the con to where this meets up with your work on Melville, because as somebody who studies this, I can't read Moby Dick as anything other than an abolitionist text, you know, talking about hunting black skins and, you know, the, and this, all of it. Um, and so I'm really curious about where you see the, uh, right. the juxtaposition and the congruence between well, them. Well, the danger of that question, of course, is that I'll just talk and talk and talk. But <laughs> try to give you a short answer. I do make the claim in the book, and I'm prepared to stand by it, that Melville was the only one of the white, classic, antebellum American writers who was deeply, genuinely, fundamentally appalled by slavery. Some people would argue with that. They would make a case for Whitman. They'd make a ca case for Emerson. But I think it was really Melville at the head of the class. So I think you're right in reading Moby Dick. You would be even more right in reading his extraordinary short novel, Benito Serino, in 1855. But the other part of the answer is that, and, and I'm talking with Andy about this a little bit before the talk, Melville's father-in-law was the Chief Justice of Massachusetts, Lemuel Shaw, who was personally opposed to slavery and found himself in the wake of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 feeling that his constitutional duty was to send fugitives back. I don't know, we have no evidence that Melville and his father-in-law ever talked about this, but if you read his late great masterpiece, Billy Budd, which is about a man, Captain Veer, faced with the question of knowing that the law, which re requires him to execute Billy for a crime that Billy had no intention to commit, had nothing to do with justice. The law and justice were at odds. That's the theme of Billy Budd. And the torment and agony of Captain Veer is one of the great works in all of world literature. I think it's, at least in part, a portrait of his father-in-law. So Melville's right at the center of this story, at least when I tell it. I think with what you said about uh, the, the 10 years being a, a difference in terms of what the North became and the unity between the Northeast and the Northwest. Uh, but a, another thing is the explosive creation of a brand new political party, which is something that doesn't happen very much, and partly through the rupturing of the Whigs. That's right. And, and as I look at the progressives and the establishment in the Democratic Party right now, I, I wonder about that too. Uh, well, well you're, you're, exactly, you're exactly right. I mean, I was with uh, another scholar last night who made this point. The, the Republican Party is the one example, which might seem odd to us today, of a brand new progressive party that emerged out of nowhere and rocketed to power within, I mean, the Republican Party really didn't come into existence until 1856, and by 1860, they captured the presidency. And then, since the Southern Democrats left town, they controlled the Congress uh, during the course of the Civil War. So, it, yes, it was a moment when the, when the two major parties, the Whigs and the Democrats, the Whigs simply disintegrated, and the Democrats basically divided between Northern Democrats who kind of reluctantly went along with the war and Southern Democrats who became uh, uh, Confederates. Uh, it's the one moment in our history when the political system simply fractured and collapsed and something new and different emerged in its place. Now, 
Do we want that? Maybe we want it. Do we want a war between the states that costs 30 or 40 million lives? That, I think, is something we should maybe try to uh, avoid, if possible. Just a quick question uh, about the political conditions over here, sorry, <laughs> uh, in the period prior uh, to that covered by your book. Uh, what stock, if any, do you put in the hypothesis that one of the reasons the southern colonies ultimately did sign on to the War of Independence and uh, American independence in general was that Great Britain was moving more rapidly to outlaw the slave trade and, and against slavery, and that, that Ameri an independent America was uh, at least a, a refuge for them. Sorry, terrible use of the word, but... Yeah. I, no, I think it's a plausible argument, and it's an aspect of our history. I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm not as familiar as I should be with uh, K through 12 textbooks these days, but I don't know how candid they are about it. Both during the Revolution and the War of 1812, which was kind of Revolution Round Two, um, uh, enslaved people in English North America fled to the British because the British offered um, emancipation. They, 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 they fled to Nova Scotia, they fled to what we now think of as Canada, which was Br British North America. And, um, uh, and now, to, to what extent this, you know, is sort of like what I said before between North and South, is that because the British were morally more farsighted or is it because they recognized, as the Union Army recognized a uh, hundred years later, that uh, these people could be an asset in their war against these uppity col colonials? Uh, there's a mixture, there's some of both. But yes, I think it was a calculation that being within a, con a confederation or union with the North would be a safer situation for their enslaved human property than being on their own. Uh, John Adams actually says that very explicitly about why they signed on to the Constitution. But I don't think they would have signed on without this fugitive slave clause. Nobody can know. You know, that's it's one of those counterfactual what if questions. But what we can know is that the northern states were not willing to call their bluff. They said, if you don't give us this, we're out of here. And the northerners didn't say, okay, goodbye. They said, okay, you got it. Uh, thank you very much for this really enlightening talk because it taught me a lot. I've always wondered about Lincoln's relationship with Frederick Douglass. Lincoln hated slavery, but he did not believe in racial equality. To what extent did uh, Douglass's friendship, whatever it was, with Lincoln have an impact on the way uh, Lincoln viewed of the relationship between the races. Well, I think it had a significant impact. And, you know, my colleague Eric Foner wrote a very good book about Lincoln called The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln and American Slavery. And I'll just say in passing, I like that title. The American Slavery comes from Lincoln's second inaugural. Carefully chosen words, he doesn't say Southern slavery or slavery, he says American slavery. Anyway, Eric's point is that Lincoln evolved. Lincoln grew. It's perfectly true that Lincoln did not envision an egalitarian biracial society of the sort that most of us take for granted as the minimum moral condition to, for a just society. But Lincoln lived at a different time and place, and I think you can watch, you can watch him grow toward that vision, and I think Douglas had a great deal to do with taking him there. It's quite, I mean, they met only three or four times. One occasion was after his delivery of the second inaugural address, when Lincoln literally saw Douglas seeking entrance to the White House at the reception afterwards, and Lincoln said to his people who were guarding, there's my friend Douglas, let him, please, bring him in. And Lincoln says to Douglas, um, Mr. Douglas, what did you think of my speech? And Douglas says to him, Mr. President, it was a sublime effort. <laughs> and, you know, if, if you follow that relationship, it's really quite extraordinary and very moving. I think, I think Douglas becomes more tolerant of the sort of political compromiser that Lincoln was, and Lincoln becomes more aware of the full humanity and the depth of, uh, of Douglas's insight and de-genius. So 
who can say if Lincoln had lived another 10 years how Reconstruction would have gone and maybe our whole history would be different, but that's one of those what-if questions. When in American history do you think that people stopped looking at runaway enslaved people as fugitives but as American heroes? As American heroes? That's a great question, and as I'm sure you're aware, if you look, you know, Frederick Douglass wrote three versions of his autobiography, and from the very beginning in the first edition, he's, he's quite careful and canny, I think, in identifying himself with traditional American heroes, like the heroes of the revolution. At one point he says, what we, what we did was, no, was, was more than what Patrick Henry did when he said, give me liberty or give me death. We actually took the risk for the sake of liberty. And he pounds home the theme, I'm as American as you are, right? And he was, he and many uh, others of his, of his black contemporaries were outraged at the proposition that a solution to the slavery problem was colonization, right? They said, what, you wanna send us back to Africa? We've, we've been here longer than you have. We are as American as you are. So one of the things you see happening in the course of the 1830s and 40s and 50s is uh, the emergence of African American American heroes, and uh, you know, you make me think of Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who led a regiment of former slaves in, uh, in, the, in the in the war, said uh, at the end of that book that he wrote about it, they shamed the nation, they shamed the nation by their actions in the war into recognizing them as men. Now that's not, I mean, that's a kind of wishful statement. Alas, we have a long way to go before America fully recognizes all its citizens of whatever color as equal. But the Civil War did accelerate that process and uh, African Americans did emerge into the public eye in, a, in, a, in an altogether new way in this period for some of the reasons that I tried to sketch out tonight. Um, on a behalf of the, some of the young people that are here with me, I actually have a somewhat radical question. Could you just talk about your process in writing? I'm sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Can you just talk about your process in writing and the power and influence that you hope a book and the books that you've written have on building a better future for America? Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, every, every writer wants to change the world. Right? Um, I'm cautioned by my wife and among other family members to keep my expectations under control. Um, but, you know, if I didn't believe, I mean, I really meant what I said at the end of this talk. It wasn't just a rhetorical flourish. I think if we are more honest about our history, we have a better chance to build a better future. And it, it really, uh, it did strike me as, as I began to talk to people about this book, most Americans really don't understand how fundamental slavery was to the creation of the Union in the first place. They're surprised to learn that the Constitution has this clause in it. And that's just one of several places in the Constitution that uh, was intended to protect slavery. So, you know, I, I don't have any illusions of grandeur, I don't think, but I, I, I do hope people will read the book uh, and will be provoked to think about our history and to talk about it with their friends and in their classes, uh, and that maybe that will incrementally lead us a little bit forward in, uh, in coming to terms with who we are and what we have to atone for, because we do, uh, and we shouldn't pretend, we, we can't sugarcoat the past, so this is, this is not a sugarcoated book. Um, people say the pic my picture is kind of grim on the book jacket. I didn't, feel, I didn't feel like smiling after I wrote this book. So thanks for the question. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Andrew Dalbanco.